Hey, good afternoon, everyone. So my name is Johnny Perez. I work as director of youth prison programs for the National Religious Campaign Against Torture. And we're a faith membership uh, uh, organization. Uh, we work across the country, uh, based in DC up to not long ago, to where we actually went virtual as a result of the shelter in place um, orders. Uh, the way that I, we engage in the work, uh, we predominantly, uh, specifically to the US prison program, you know, we focused on faith, the faith communities and folks who've been directly impacted by the system, such as myself. We do that in three different ways. We do that through public education, uh, like we're doing now. You know, we, we bring advocates together. We convene people, you know, to educate the public on the issues that they're directly working on. And we also do this through training. So we work with faith leaders and uh, solitary survivors and people who've been impacted by the system to build their capacity, educate them, build their capacity, train them in a lot of different areas, uh, and then plug them into legislative campaigns looking to end solitary confinement. And then the third way that we engage in the work is through coalition work. So we partner you know, with uh, 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 local organizations and coalitions, people on the ground, you know, um, to actually push the legislative change. And that looks different across different states. Uh, uh, right now, we're active across 11 different states, uh, all with active legislation looking to end the torture or solitary confinement. So today, what we wanted to do as part of Torture Awareness Month is that we wanted to bring uh, in this entire month, you know, uh, a, a plethora of conversations that a people are not having and need to have, or people are having it or not having it right because they're not including folks who've been directly impacted by the issue and actually working on these issues. So we miss those nuances. So. Uh, uh, we continually try to just bring these voices directly to the folks who, you know, who are in our network. So today, we're actually be talking about youth leadership uh, as it relates to criminal justice reform. We're in a really pivotal, um, I mean, we, it feels like we've always been in a pivotal moment in our country, but I will say, you know, in my short time on this earth, you know, um, I've seen a lot of social justice, social movements and changes. And, you know, this protest right now that is currently happening right now, as a result of the killing of George Floyd, you know, has brought out people, you know, in ways in which, in which maybe uh, some folks could not fathom, you know, and I'm more inspired actually by the young people who are leading the charge, you know, in a lot of different ways, you know. Um, so as a result, we wanted to bring folks in to speak specifically, you know, to youth leading on criminal justice reform, not only through their perspective, both locally and also nationally. Um, so we have Alyssa Beck, who um, is advocacy specialist at the Dolores Bar Weaver Policy Center. Uh, also brought in um, Aisha Le, who works as a youth advocate at the Juvenile Justice at Juvenile Just Juvenile for Justice, sorry, at the Juvenile Law Center. Um, also her, uh, Hernan Carvente Martinez, who works at uh, as a National Youth Partnership Strategist uh, at Youth First Initiative. Um, Ileana uh, Ileana Pujols, Director of Community Co Connections at the Connecticut Juvenile Justice Alliance, and also um, Xavier, Xavier, I always get your name and stuff. Um, Xavier McElrath, am I getting right? Elrath Bay, great. Senior <laughs> advisor and national advocate at the Campaign for Fair Sentencing and Youth, and we actually worked together recently at a, at a, on a project, a cold project witness, which we'll talk a little bit about later. Uh, but Ron, just right now, I wanna pull back and create space for all of you to you know, take a minute, introduce yourselves, you know, talk a little bit about the work that you're doing and then we'll get right into the conversation. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, we'll start with you, Alyssa. <laughs> I had a feeling I would be first. Um, okay. And I'm coming to uh, Hernan next. <laughs> um, hello, everybody. My name is Alyssa Beck. I am the advocacy specialist at the Dolores Bar Weaver Policy Center um, located in Jacksonville, so a lot of my work um, involves um, advocacy work around um, several different things with juvenile justice reform, but also focusing on girls um, that are victims and survivors of sex trafficking. Um, and so using not only my personal experiences, but the experiences of other youth and young people that I've interacted with along my journey, um, I really help to uplift my story and the stories of other people to ensure that things continue to change and um, you know that these young people, these young girls and these systems aren't continuing to be failed. Um, and so I do that on a local level, state le level and national level, really by training the people that um, have the power to make changes. Um, with these young people. Thank you so much. Awesome. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you, Johnny um, and then our cat for hosting this event. Um, my name is Hernan Carvente Martinez. I use he, they pronouns. I'm the youth partnership strategist at the Youth First Initiative. 
And what that really means is that I get to work with young people um, across the different states that we have partnered with at Youth First. And each of these state campaigns that we have partnered with focuses on closing youth prisons and reinvesting that money into community alternatives. And so my job as a formerly incarcerated person and someone who started off this in this movement eight years ago as a young leader is to now empower the next generation of young people who are coming into this space and into this movement, right? And so this whole conversation for me is really important and I'm really honored that Johnny, um, you know, titled this, you know, Youth Leading the Way uh, very intentionally because that's what I'm here to do, really, to just support the next generation of leaders who are going to take on this role, um, because we're trying to make sure that prisons aren't a thing for the next generation, that prisons aren't a thing for my daughter, my little brother, for other young people out there in the world. And so I'm just really honored to be here, um, and I'm really looking forward to being a part of this conversation. Thanks. Uh, I'm Ashley Watson from um, Juveniles for Justice, the Juvenile Law Center here, going on a third and our uh we it's we are you uh, i'm a youth advocate okay so we are youth that uh come together that are in the foster care system and the juvenile justice system who come together and try to make a change for people in our same situation whether we still in that situation or we were in that situation we try to make sure uh youth that's like us won't be put in them uh them situations to go to placement or to foster care it could be other alternatives and i i do this because well i got a daughter and i don't want my daughter to go through what i went through or anything my friends and stuff went through so i strive to cha uh, make a change for all youth like all youth period because it's a chance anybody can uh, go through what i went through nice. thank you Yes, and um, I'm Xavier McElrath Bay, again, um, Senior Advisor uh, with the Campaign for the First Sensing of Youth. Thank you, Johnny, for having me in this space. Proud to stand along these leaders and advancing this important message around uh, youth leadership. Although I have to confess, um, in much of the work that we do um, is centered around the efforts of formerly incarcerated youth. And as an organization, the Campaign for the First Sensing of Youth that focuses exclusively upon ending life without parole and other extreme sentences for kids in the country, that means many of the advocates within our space, um, sadly and unfortunately, were individuals who, had went, in prison, who went into prison as, as children and came out as adults. Uh, much like myself, uh, they were given a consequence that was designed for adults. And, um, and so that is the focus of our reform, of our reform efforts. Um, the ICANN network, which is a, the Incarcerated Children's Advocacy Network, um, is 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 the banner uh, that we that we carry uh, uh, and through the work that we do of uh, public education and advocacy, and much of that is centered around storytelling, is centered around um, helping to change the narrative, especially and much like what what we talked about earlier around policy and cultural change that we hope to ensure that in in many spaces and particularly in spaces where this is most challenging that people will come to understand that kids are different and they deserve an opportunity for redemption and that all kids are are worthy of compassion and that's the work that i do couldn't agree more we we'll save the best for last thank you um so yeah my name is iliana pujols i work with the connecticut juvenile justice alliance as their director of community connections also have the luxury of being a partner with the youth first initiative um, and aside from my personal experience as a young person, I also get the luxury of supervising a young group of directly impacted people um, ages 18 to 25 who work with us per diem and they basically work with us directly to push our advocacy efforts and sort of create our advocacy agenda. So also super grateful to be here. A lot of familiar faces on the panel and very excited for today's conversation. So thank you, Johnny. Nice. Thank you. Thank you all. So let's, so let's jump right into it. You know, before the webinar actually went live, we were talking about how, you know, like this current moment, right, where across the country, I want to say across the world, you know, people have come out, all races, colors, and ages, but particularly young people have come out, you know, um, uh, on behalf of justice against, you know, racism, against police brutality, you know, um, yelling Black Lives Matter of all, of all races and colors, but we've seen them not only in, in, in the criminal justice space now and talking about these issues, but also even, you know, in other spaces like environmental climate change and even uh, issues around food justice, we've seen young people really leading the way. I guess I wanted to start the conversation on what, you know, from, from, your, from your lens, from your point of view, you know, at least it feels like pe young people are more engaged today more than ever, you know, and if that's true, 
then why do you think that's that's happening? Like, what's different now in this moment than than maybe years back? And I post that to, to everyone. Yeah. So um, I'll jump, and then everybody can sort of jump off of each other's responses. Um, I think that. Being in Connecticut, obviously, I only see what they're exhibiting on either social media or Connecticut itself. Um, but I think that young people are starting to realize that, one, their voice holds power, right? Mm -hmm. So they're so used to constantly being shut out. Um, seeing all these other young people across the states modeling this power has sort of given everybody the... Um, I don't want to say, I guess the courage and the confidence to really just come out and just be loud about their needs and, you know, be heard and understanding that they can be a part of the movement as well. Um, I think that's really what, from what I'm seeing is really pushing young people to get out on the streets and then them also realizing like this is something that is affecting our lives, right? We're losing family members, people who are blocks away from us next door, whatever it is. Um, and I think that they're just realizing that it's it's becoming a serious thing, right? This is our livelihood, our our safety that's at risk. Um, so I think just they're becoming more comfortable with being bold and, you know, coming out and just recognizing their power, owning it, honing it, and just being masters about it. Um, and yeah, they're just tired. They're tired of seeing what's going on in all these different states and seeing it happen constantly and how different the repercussions are for somebody who's a Latino or a black person compared to predominantly white folks. Um, they're, they're not, you know, clueless. They're aware of the differences. So I think those are just some factors that are playing into um, how active young people are becoming in the movement. I agree. Um, I feel, I, I feel like like that, so we growing up, we see our fathers, brothers get uh, just like locked up for no reason or just got racially profiled. Be, oh, you look like this person. You look like you fit this description. Or uh, yeah, like a lot of stuff that had to do like racially. And we could like never like speak up because one of us speaking up is not going to do nothing. A few of us speaking up not going to do nothing. Once everybody starts, speaking up then we can jump in and then we make Actually, you're breaking up a little bit bigger than we to speak up. So it, uh Yeah we're having a hard time uh hearing you I shall we we are taught we like some of us okay now yeah Can you hear me now? yes that's way better hold it right there yes <laughs> yeah okay um so what i was saying was okay so some of us just taught this now about our like our uh past and all that like so when i was younger i wasn't taught it like i was only taught like Christopher Columbus, all like stuff that didn't have really nothing to do with our our past. Now we taught this and we feel like like we can do stuff about it, but we're gonna have to wait till we get older and because people will listen to us more when we get older. As you nobody not gonna listen to us, like y'all just kids, you're not saying nothing, you're not really. So now that everybody joining together and like we all making a change now, because everybody feel comfortable with speaking up about it now. Thank you. Yeah, I can go. Um, I'm in an awkward sort of position, right? And Johnny, I've talked to you about this. Most of you on this know this, right? But, you know, because I was at some point youth voice, youth leader, youth everything, and I've tried to transition now at age 28 to the sort of an ally and an adult support, I've come to understand uh, in my reflections that not only have young people, like others have said before, already been showing up and just sometimes lack the resources and tools to really get this done, um, they've always been there and it's just been adults co-opting a lot of their messaging and their language, to be honest. And so like, I really want to like be very intentional about um, knowing that like I've in the last eight years that I've been doing this work, I've had to challenge a lot of folk in nonprofits and philanthropy and government to really start looking at young people no longer as the problem that needs to be solved, but as solutions to those problems. And I think we now are actively seeing that becoming uh, the hip new thing, right? Like funders are paying for it. Nonprofits want a board of young people on their table, or even beyond that, they want them on staff, they want them uh, on their actual boards, the decision-making boards, not advisory boards. 
And so I think there's just been a huge recognition in the last um, at least five years, uh, just from my time being out of eight, in, in making sure that young people are now no longer just uh, seen as the little poster child that you have, you know, representing your organization, but actual partners uh, in this work and intentionally telling us what direction uh, we should head in as organizations and as people, but also leading us into the future. So that's why I'm seeing, I think now, just reflecting back at 28, that I think that that's been an intentional role that many of us, Xavier and Johnny, some of us when we were younger, you know, we were actively trying to create that space. Nobody heard us. And now there is a space and like young people lead the way. And I think that that's just the way we're supposed to do it all the time. Before we get to Alyssa, I really appreciate that, that response because later on, we're going to really talk about some concrete solutions and really center young people beyond just like their stories, you know, um, which, which is the thing I've also been vocal about. Like, we can't just call on young people. We need to share their stories. We need to be asking them. How, this, how is this policy impacting you or your community and how can we change it and et cetera. But Alyssa? Sure. Um, I, th I think like for me um, growing up, I always felt like in a way I was silenced. Um, I was silenced by institutions. I was silenced by adults. I was silenced by, you know, anyone that really was like supposed to be there and help me um, because they, you know, they look down at me like, you know, you're just a child, you're a young person. Um, how can you know what's best for your life? You know, I always remember being in courtrooms and everyone telling me what was best for me without asking me what was best for me. Um, and it was finally when I, you know, was incarcerated and I sat and I talked to other women and I talked to other girls and I realized like our stories are so much similar and what can we do together to start impacting change. Um, and so when I got out of incarceration, it was really when I started using my own voice to, you know, advocate in my community and in, in my community, youth voice was not a thing. Um, so now fast forward to today, I think, you know, youth are now really leading a lot of these movements and, you know, I, and I still see people trying to shut young people down. But the reality is, you know, we've always had a voice. It's just we needed these platforms to be able to use our voices, you know, platforms like the one you're creating here for us today. Um, you know, I, I just think today youth are tired. They're tired of seeing their uncles being killed. They're tired of seeing their fathers being killed. They're tired of, you know, their, their, you know, family members getting life in prison. They're tired of themselves going to jail. And so they're seeing that, you know, for us to not continue to see this in the future, we have to somehow use our voices because we don't you know, this can't continue to go on. This has been happening for so many years. And if we don't step up and really make some sort of change, our kids are gonna to continue to go through the same things that our fathers and we do too as well. Um, and so, you know, I always say, you know, we have a voice, you know, we always have these voices. It's just, you know, us, each other, creating platforms to, to be able to really use those voices. You know, to, to Hernan's point about, you know, making sure that, you know, we, like that we, 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 we're not only calling young folks on, but like we're including them in policy decisions, right? Like here it is, people are joining boards and creating all these different things and, and coalitions and like young people are involved that are, I guess, nonprofit, right, has built a space for young folks to step into in a way in which is different today than it was years ago, to Hernan's point. And I think part of that was uh, literally like the misconceptions that we have uh, about youth. I think that adults have around with youth, right? That, you know, youth, well, they're young, so they can't be educated. You know, uh, you know they're, they don't know any better. They don't have anything to say or all of these misconceptions that actually, you know, um, kind of perpetuate a lot of the same harm that we're actually trying to stop in some different ways. So I guess I want to hear from, from you know, Alyssa, Eliana, and Aisha Ale, you know, if, if y'all can talk about, you know, um, like how can we center the voices of young folks, you know, and young people, you know, and, and I'm not talking about the stories, right? Because like we hear that all the time, you know, it's like, oh, well, we have to give them, so and, and, and that is important, not that stories that don't have value, you know, I think stories are important, you know, but if the only time I'm calling a young person is to say, hey, tell me about like the bad things that happened to you, then, then we're missing the mark. So in your response, like how can we really center folks in the middle of legislative campaigns or change or prison abolition, sentencing, like, what, like whatever issue it is, to really center these folks? What does that look like? 
So um, a little bit of background based on my personal experience with the Alliance. I came into my role that I have now when I was 19, currently 22. So I actually got to take part in building their program of the Justice Advisors and what that looked like, um, how to involve them in the work, how to make sure that they're supported in every way. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a lot of wheels that you have to spin at the same time, right? Um, you want to bring young people into the work to make sure that their opinions and their voices are included on what goes on as far as the work. But you also need to make sure that they're prepared, right? And they have the tools, whether it's emotional support, um, actual professional support, personal support, whatever it is, you need to make sure that you build that into your plan as well, right? Because there's going to be a lot of things that people don't think of when bringing young people into this work. Um, one of the things that I tried to be very intentional about was making sure that we taught everybody the basics of the basics, right? So what is juvenile justice? What is legislation? Um, it's very clear that there's a, a communication barrier in many spaces, right? So even myself, when I step into some rooms and they use like acronyms or words that I never heard before, or they call a group a cohort or a cadre or whatever it's called, I'm like, I, I don't know what that means, right? So I went back and made sure that I teach my team, this is how you voice when you're just straight up confused. You mm -hmm. let people know, I need you to clarify that. What does that mean, right? Don't be embarrassed to ask questions and ask for clarification. Um, because most of the times that's how people make you feel less confident about what you wanna say. Or they make you feel like you don't understand what the conversation is, right? Mm -hmm. So just making sure that you, whatever group you cultivate in, in your workspace and whatever group you have, making sure that they are prepared and not only that but very comfortable with the staff that work with them right because there's going to be instances where you have to let them know like you're not going to know what's going on in this space you're not going to understand what's going on in this room but we want to shift that culture right and we want to get everybody in the room to talk the same language where it makes this makes sense right and they're clarifying what they mean um and just being able to identify when they're genuinely in a situation where they're valued for their expertise and not their story Right, so going back to not wanting to tokenize young people um, and just acknowledging that these are the people closest to the problem, right? So they're closest to that solution. You might as well just hear the information straight from the horse's mouth, right? What in, you, you've lived this experience, so what, how can we solve that problem? Yeah. Um, so I think it's just taking all those things into consideration and making sure that you're valuing that and holding standards to yourself i don't know <laughs> no, I, re I really appreciate that so and before I, before i pass it over to you i shall you know for first of all i sit on the board of the juvenile law center and, and you know they have the youth advocacy program there and and you know like hearing hearing from you all directly like exactly some of these things it just makes me feel good about the fact that i'm supporting you know like their work you know and i shall i know you work with juveniles for justice over at the at the juvenile law center um, do you have any insight as to like how you know we can really truly center the voices of young young people um, in these conversations around changing like society? You know. Uh, yes, I feel like we should always like people should always have the youth at the table when they having conversations. Add them uh, like put them in more programs, um, like J for J. Oh. Like host events with pe with youth, like we like our, us youth, like we know, like we we would know more of what we would do. So, like ask, like get more youth involved. Like you can start with one and have them like recommendations. Like what should we do? Like me, because <laughs> I'm still I'm only twenty. Mm -hmm. So like me. Uh, you should get like youth, like what should we do, recommendations or how you think people like, I mean like youth would want to join, uh, like be a part of this. I know y'all want to, but like how can we like bring them in? Mm -hmm. Thank you, thanks. You know, I, I was thinking about how a lot of times, especially research organizations, like or, or anyone doing research, you know, there are a lot of times when they create research instruments you know, and don't involve young people like directly in the process right at the beginning. And I can't stress the importance of having, you know, um, folks in right, right from the beginning, not only to interpret your findings later on, which is like <laughs> too late, but also in creating the instrument, making sure that, um, that, that it, uh, uh, it's, you know, it's, it's administered right. And of course, to, to try to, to translate the information. Sorry, my son was like screaming in the background and it threw me off. Um, so let's get right into the next, into the next question, the segue, that awkward moment. 
Um, and I see some some comments in the, in the chat. Please drop any questions, any thoughts, ideas in, in the chat. And when we get to the Q and A portion, which is actually not not far from now, um, we'll 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 unpack some of the things that are being said inside of the comments. Uh, for my next question, I said I wanted to uh, you know just asking, just thinking around youth organizing, you know, and uh, I'll, you know I want to um, like you know what are what are some of the challenges in organizing young people, right? What are some ways that faith leaders in particular you know, can empower young people, you know, to want to become, if they're not already, like civically engaged. You know, and I want to lead, I want Alyssa and Rihanna and Aisha Lee to lead that, uh, but also, you know, Hernan and Xavier, you know, if, if you have anything to add after they mentioned that, it would be great to hear from you. Okay, um, well, most youth may not, like they might not have the resources to get engaged. Like don't nobody tell them, like won't give them like resources to not do what they're doing instead of like going sh straight to like, you need to be here, you need to be there. No, they don't give them uh, like, I'm sorry, <laughs> like this. <laughs> um, yeah, they they don't know like the steps to take to be a part of things. Mm -hmm. So they need like guidance and people who can give them resources and stuff to uh, like complete the what they're trying to do or what they uh, would, would be better for them to do. Mm -hmm. nice. Eliana, you have any thoughts? Yeah, I would say that it's not, there's no um, very easy answer as to what is the best way to organize young people. There's a lot of different factors that play into that, right? Mistrust, um, lack of information, personal experiences they might have that didn't work before, right? And then when you think about organizing, right, a lot of the big issues that we're trying to push need policy change. Mm -hmm. And to even understand what goes on in the policy world takes a lot of time, and there's not a lot of paid positions for young people to do that in, right? Mm -hmm. So a lot of this organizing and being involved stuff is very time consuming and to take time out of whether it's their work day, their school day, um, and to not be compensated in return for that is hard, right? And then you gotta also think a lot of them are just scared to broadcast themselves out there. I know I have friends and colleagues that just won't go to a protest because they know that it's either like not safe for them, they don't wanna be targeted, whatever it may be. So it's just a lot of different things that go into um, how rough it is to try to like organize young people, including things like transportation, yeah. right? And little stuff like that, childcare, whatever it may be, there's so many different factors that play into that that just make it rough. I had a young person, before I started doing advocacy work, I volunteered at the Police Athletic League and I just came home, I was trying to just, you know, uh, make sense of like doing 13 years in prison, like how can I use this experience? And I always appreciated talking to young people. And um, one of the kids is like, so now I don't got no email. What's an email? And I, and I realized, right, that I had to communicate, I had to use the medium in which, you know, he was using and not try to bring him to my medium. So for the adults who are watching, you know, always want to email, you know, you may just have a, you might have to slide on his DM to say, hey, are you coming to the rally tonight? <laughs> you know, and like that kind of thing, you know, um, uh, because, because this is where, like, you know, I think that's part of the divide, right, where we're expecting people to meet us where we're at instead of meeting them like where, the, where they're at, you know? So I want to pull the veil back a little bit and look at this, look at this from a macro national perspective, you know? And, you know, uh, just like Hernan and Xavier, I do national work and, and, and it's great to, it's, it's impactful when I'm able to see this conversation through a lot of different lenses, through different states and different systems, you know? So I, I guess what I want to ask you both, you know, both working on prison abolition and sentencing, you know, um, Hey, does it feel like legislators value the voice of young people? Do they actually see them as a powerful constituency? You know, um, if not, what, what is it going to take to get there? And if so, um, you know, uh, almost, I almost want to say what took them so long to recognize the fact that, um, that young people um, have like true constituency power in a lot of different states, especially when organized, right? So just kind of, you know, if you're not going to react to, to some of that, would be awesome. Either one of you. <laughs> Look, I love the humility. Xavier, you'll go first since we haven't heard from you and then we'll go to her nine. 
Oh, you would call me out, not saying. <laughs> um, you know, I'm I'm just honestly, I feel like I'm here more to learn than to inform. And just hearing these leaders speak their truth, and you know, the fact that it matters, I'm I'm far from a youth, and even in my experience of learning about the work, I was way, well into adulthood. I've been with a campaign now for six years, and um, coming on board was really still much of a, sh a cultural shock for me, to be honest with you. I was working in the space of gay intervention, violence prevention. I was doing a lot of crisis work in the community. And, um, and, and, and soon after that, I was doing uh, clinical research at Northwestern University. So when I was thrown into this world of advocacy, um, I had to admit, I, was, I felt very intimidated. I was, there was a complete disconnect. Um, and you know, I remember one of my first experiences that I had, um, and, and believe me, the campaign went above and beyond. It taught me many things, obviously, but one of the more comical and perhaps informative pieces that helped me was watching that video. It says, this is a bill. Bill, you remember that? You all remember that video? Um, it talks about the life and the cycle of a bill and what that looks like. And, and there was a cartoon. And I'm like, come on, y'all. <laughs> but obviously, we had much more intense and more, more advocacy training around that. And um, they did a great job, I have to say. You know, but even still, going into the, to the Nevada State Capitol, which is where, where I first went, was still quite intimidating. Um, and the fact that it matters is that most people in that building didn't look like me. Um, the majority of people in that building were speaking a language that I still had yet to fully understand. And I, and I just, you know, I realized that I just had to be able to speak my truth. And that's exactly what I did, along with other former incarcerated leaders. And interest, interestingly, the outcome was a unanimous decision in our favor to abolish life without parole. And with that victory came the recognition that our voices were very critical in, that, in those spaces. And, the, and one thing that I would never forget, and one of the legislators had said, you know, he said a lot of people, you know, they, they, they live through life and they, they act as if they, their, their accomplishments and everything else are, are indicative of, of them having hit a home run. Not recognizing that many of them um, were born on third base. And that sort of resonated with me because I felt like I think what was most informative for legislators is to be able to hear and understand how their lives were very much different from ours. That the trauma we experienced, that the environments that we were faced with, not only made us ill equipped to be able to stand in those spaces and speak power to truth, um, but also in so many ways were very, very targeted uh, towards our population, towards the youth in our communities. And I will go back to the earlier question, and I think it's important to note that one of the greatest barriers in my eyes uh, that, that, that stops and impedes youth leadership in these spaces, the fact that our kids, in fact, are being targeted. Um, and they are the individuals who are dealing with uh, great challenge in their communities. And if you think about Maslow's hierarchy of needs, we know that food, shelter, we know that all these things are important. And I think that uh, for, for a youth to take on that level of leadership, that individual has to at least be very much scratching the surface of self-actualization to be able to live according to the ideals that they believe. And I remember even in prison, having the strong desire at that young age to make a difference, but still having to be very much focused, very much unfortunately focused upon my day-to-day -day survival. And so I, I just wanna echo that, you know, as much as we think about cultural change and policy change, as much as we think about youth leadership, let's not forget they are also being targeted. In fact, in fact they are most, most disproportionately being, being targeted. And so uh, that would be my answer to that question. And going to the, the question of cultural and policy change, we have well, to- wait, no, we're not there yet. Wait, wait, oh, oh, oh. Yeah, I know. I know you was okay. ready. Hold on, hold that one. Okay, okay. Hold that well, you one. got my, my thoughts rolling. Yeah, hold hold yeah. that one for me. Keep that flowing. Write it down. And I'm, okay. <laughs> I'm with you on that. I'm with you on that. Well, I'll leave it at that. Again, I'm here to learn and listen, and I really appreciate it. Well, well, I'll say, I'll say something, because like, you know, there's, you know, the, I was incarcerated as a kid too, 16 years old, put in solitary confinement because I defended myself for using a gang, uh, 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 a phone that was like run by gangs inside of prison. And, you know, it was like, oh, I can't call my lawyer. Like, how can I not call my lawyer? My mother let him know. And I ended up in solitary 60 days as a result, you know? In that moment, there were things that I would have said had you asked me. And then there are things that I would say now that I couldn't, possibly fathom up as it was in that moment, you know, um, that I can tell you now, 
You know, A and then B, when it talks like, when we're talking about issues around juvenile justice and things like that, it's like folks are targeted on the outside, right? Like kid, our young people are targeted and mistreated uh, disproportionately, especially youth of color out, out in the street. But, you know, um, to this recent Daily News article, which I'll drop, is that there's also a lot of violence inside of prisons. And New York was one of the last states where the age of criminal responsibility, <laughs> you know, um, was, was recently raised. But before that, we were sending kids to, to places like Rikers Island and, and all these other places. Um, so there's violence that happens inside. And also this idea that there's physical violence, but then there's, there's different types of violence. When you have a 17-year-old that gets sentenced to 50 years, you know, um, that's a different type of violence that we're, we're happening here. So as a person who's working on sentencing reform specifically for young people, I felt that it was important to be involved in this conversation. But Hernan, um, uh, before we get into the policy piece, can you, can you, can you, can you talk a little bit about that, um, the, 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 the original question around engaging leg, around legislators, recognizing the power of, of young people and seeing them as a, as a constituency in a sense? Yeah, I think uh, the moment young people began to remind legislators that at some point they will be the people who will either be voting them in or voting them out of office, I think that that's when legislators realize like, oh shit, like this is a constituency we have to listen to. I think the second thing is is really acknowledging the fact that, you know, there have been consistent uh, youth voices, youth faces, Alyssa, Eliana, Michelle, like all of us here that were on this panel, like these young people are legitimately the ones that are hitting those legislators' offices. And the moment these legislators see that consistent face of like, this young person is not giving up, this young person is in our face, that we need to hear them. I think that's what's making uh, a lot of these legislators realize that there is a need to listen to young people more intentionally. And so shout out to the three of them for really being here and, and reminding us, right, that like, I at some point was like on every single panel as a young person and I got tired of that, right? Like Eliana has heard me say this, Alyssa has heard me say this, Xavier, all of you have heard me say this, right? That part of what's been powerful now and why I think uh, legislators around the country are listening is because a lot of them uh, realize that one, some of them are, are literally, and I'm, I'm gonna keep it real, y'all, they're, they're going out the door. Some of them are hitting that age where like, you can't hold that seat of, of, of being a legislator for so long and some of the young people who are currently leading in our communities are going to take those seats. And so you either are uh, in favor of them and supporting them, or you're going to have a really tenacious advocate at your front door every day causing a ruckus and really being intentional about disrupting, not for the sake of disrupting, but for their communities. And so I think uh, what we need to really uh, emphasize in this conversation um, is really the important need for legislators and other elected officials to understand that Young people um, at this point very much carry the solutions that will help us, right? When we've had conversations at Youth First around what, you know, what a reimagined world without youth prisons would look like, uh, we asked young people, right? You know, like in New York, $450,000 to house one young person for one year. What would you do with $450,000, y'all? Like straight up, right? Or 31, 32 million that it takes to run Brooklyn Secure Center, which is the facility that I was in. You ask young people that, they're talking about building jobs, building homes, giving their peace cars, you know, uh, I'll never forget Philly, y'all, like, uh, Ishele, y'all, and, and people out there, right, like, one young person said, build uh, paintball courts in every community, so we shoot each other with paintballs and not bullets, so nobody would die. I'm never going to forget that, right, because that, for me, was a vivid picture of, like, this young person that doesn't care about vocational training right now, they just care about not dying. So I think legislators need to hear these stories more, and honestly, Young people, uh, thank you if you're tuning in because there's like high school, middle school yeah. students like literally commenting like legit, y'all are the future and y'all need to really, if you need us as mentors, you need us as support. I'm throwing Johnny in there, I'm throwing Xavier, we need to mentor them. <laughs> nice. So uh, <laughs> thank you for that and like grounding us in your right, like, you know, um, you know, to Alyssa, I shall and, 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 you know, Eliana, like really pounding that pavement and the frustrations of having to deal with legislators who say they value one thing, but then won't take actual physical steps to kind of recognize what those values look like in policy change. And so it's, 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 it's frustrating. You know, um, I, I want to pull the, the, the I want to talk about this, this relationship between policy change and cultural change that Xavier was ready to go in on, um, uh, you know, um, actually for, for everyone, you know, um, you know, this, this relationship between policy change and cultural change, right? There's, there's different schools of thought that, you know, you know, if you change the policies, the culture will follow. If you change the culture, but not the policies, you know, um, like this relationship between, between the two. And I guess I, 
I guess what I want to, what I kind of like want to tease out from from all of you, especially in this moment, this political moment, um, where, I mean, I don't know, like it, it's so heavy that a few weeks ago I had just I had to like take a few days off. I'm like, I just need to take a few days off to just process COVID nineteen, right? And how corrections is putting everyone in solitary because they think that's the best way to protect people, including young folks, you know. And then you have you know, the constant killing, you know, of, 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 you know, people of color of, in this country by police officers, right? And, and, and the trauma that that does, you know, to, to us, you know, um, both directly and even to our family members and friends, you know, and some folks tend to think, well, we need to change these policies, you know, that allow for these things to happen and we're good. Other folks are like, forget the policies, we need to change the culture of this country, the fabric, of this country and the policies will follow, you know? And, and I guess I, I, you know, I, I don't think there's a right or wrong, but I really do want to hear from all of you as far as like what those thoughts, you know, like what comes up for you when you hear me say these things um, and just reflect on it. Um, Xavier, you can go ahead. I know you had yours, I asked you to hold this, so you can jump us off and then we'll, 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 we'll yeah. um, uh, folks can just self-select and, and hop in as they feel comfortable. You know, it's interesting. I'm thinking about, you know, what you, I'm listening to you and I'm just reflecting on the past couple of days and my, my experiences that I've seen how the sort of cultural shift continues to take way. And for example, the DC mayor painting, painting on the ground leading towards the, the, the Capitol, uh, Black Lives Matter, you know, and then, you know, a little insight. I've been like searching uh, for a home and I was on Redfin earlier and it said Black Lives Matter. And I'm like, oh, yes, yes, you know, like it's happening, you know, it's, it's, and, it's, and it's because of youth leadership. It's because of those voices, you know, and NASCAR too. NASCAR was big because like, that's I mean, what's up. Yeah, yes. And just to see those victories and to me, each one is so great and big. And, you know, in, in, in not so hopeful times, you know, I have, to, I have to say years back when we started this work around youth sentencing reform um, and, and hopeful, you know, to the extent that, yes, we were willing and able to, to lead the work. Um, we, I remember times we entered states that were really, we were particularly challenging. And I'm gonna give a quick story very briefly to give my, my insight into one of, the most, um, one of the most amazing cultural shifts that I had seen. In 2017, we went to Arkansas and, and while there, uh, we tried to advance a bill that was to end life without parole for kids in our state. Um, we saw a decent amount of support and going into the Judiciary, to the judiciary Committee hearing, um, we were suddenly, we suddenly hit a brick wall. And that brick wall, uh, unfortunately, uh, came through the voice of, uh, of a legislator who had lost a child to violence. Um, uh, Rebecca Petty was someone who believe strongly in accountability, who believe very strongly in justice and, 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 and the way in which she had defined it. And through the lens and through the, through the, the, through the prism of what her experience was, and our bill died in that, in that committee hearing uh, two years, about a year and a half later after much thought and strategizing and just deep soul searching and, and really reflecting upon her needs and what she went through, we came back to Arkansas and we sat there and we had, it was myself and it was a, a woman Linda White, who had lost her child to, to violence, and but a woman who had come to believe in second chances of redemption for kids. And we had sat in that, in that space along with James Dold, our, our policy director at the time. And we had a very deep heart-to-heart -heart conversation. Oh, not to, if to mention one of our bill sponsors there. And during that conversation, um, I remember there was, there was a picture um, hanging right above me because I remember at, at points of when I would get nervous I would just look around and it was a very emotionally intense conversation and I'll never forget seeing that there was it was the last supper and Jesus was there obviously in the painting and I'm looking over and I'm observing her office and I'm realizing that this is a woman of faith and in that in, in that conversation I came to discover we all came to discover that both Linda White and Rebecca Petty had some things in common they both suffered loss, extreme dear loss. They both had a lot of hurt and pain as a result, obviously. And they all went through changes in, in, in what it meant uh, to be able to reconcile their thoughts of com compassion. And interestingly, during that time, and, and you know, when we were having that conversation, Rebecca had been going through some personal changes herself. And after hearing us out and after the many tears and many uh, disclosures and even me sharing about my remorse about my involvement in the homicide as a child, 
I remember the, one of the last questions that Rebecca asked was, well, do you all have someone uh, that's sponsoring the bill? And we said, yes, we, we named the bill sponsor. And she, she nodded and she says, have you thought about asking me uh, to support the bill? And we were just stuck. And we didn't believe that, that someone who killed our bill two years prior was someone who now suddenly was able to understand that kids are different, who was willing to allow through her experiences and now her, her, uh, her belief in second chances to help spark and, and create a cultural shift and within their state capital. And within a matter of months, she was one of the most bold speakers, in fact, the very most bold speaker on that floor. And she helped to ensure a reform that not only um, stops the life without parole sentence from being um, imposed in the future, but also ensure that many folks are coming out. And many people are coming out. Many have, uh, I've been out for some months now, and many of them are now some of our closest friends. And so that's my, that's one of the best examples of cultural shift. I think that it starts with the culture. I think it starts with relationships. I think it starts with us sharing, opening up, being vulnerable, and helping them understand that we are human. And I think that in her experiences, most importantly, she came to recognize that all kids deserve a second chance. And I think that's what was most meaningful for her and why she was willing to take hold of this work. And that's, that's, that's my best example. Thanks, thanks. Can we have from one, one other person on that, on the relationship between um, policy change and culture? Or we can, actually, we won't. Well, let's go right into our panelist questions. And I said, I'm going to go to you, Aisha Ale. There's a question from, for you in the comments. Um, it is, uh, can you share if there are other ways that you feel have helped, uh, we feel have been helpful through uh, a J4J to help youth stay involved and connected to the work? Um, yes. Uh, well, for, for starters, we get paid. We get paid to uh, work with J4J. <laughs> and they give us transportation so they'll ensure that we'll be back and forth there, have a way to get back and forth. Nice. It's like we can ask people to do something, but we also have to give them the resources to ensure that they're able to carry out what we're asking them to do, right? Mm -hmm. There's another question here about ageism, which I think is important, kind of scratch a little bit about it, where, you know, when we talk about ageism, we usually uh, talk about it toward people who are older, but not necessarily toward people who, who, are, who are younger. And um, uh, Steve uh, in the comments said, I think that the topic of ageism is often left out when thinking about youth. It is more, it is more so linked to older people when in fact ageism affect all ages and I've often been discredited for being older. The idea that you only can hold knowledge with age. Um, well, I've often been discredited for being older. And just the same way that younger folks are discredited for being for being younger, in some in some in some in some cases, anyone have any reactions to that? I think that that speaks to the question that was mentioned in the chat right before that, where somebody had said like, "Oh, you guys all look older. How old are you guys?" Like I expected younger people on the panel, right? Mm -hmm. um, but how how rare is it that you'll find a 15, 16, 17 year old who's currently in the system that's comfortable enough and willing to broadcast themselves on a national platform like this um it's really hard so i do think that going back to what what he had said about ageism it's often just spoken on behalf of like older people like we go in or i go into places and they're like oh she could handle all the stuff online like she could set up the zoom she could do all the tech stuff because she's young and she got it down packed and i don't even know how to set up a zoom so it's like how that goes hand in hand with like the older person on our team knows how to handle handle the zoom stuff but not me um sometimes it's vice versa and i i do think that sometimes they assume like oh she's younger she needs more prep or she needs this i mean this event i didn't even prep for <laughs> you know i was like oh these are regular questions i'm just gonna go in there and answer them um so yeah i do think that ageism often just runs uh, alongside older folks but i think it has a lot to do with like people should be having conversations about how that shows up in the younger crowd. And, and you don't have to remember what you know, right? Mm -hmm. which, is, which, you know, what you lived or, or like our experience currently experiencing, you know? Um, so that's a, that's a strong piece. I also, what comes up for me when I hear ageism too is, is the idea that uh, young people, particularly young black women are, are, 
are adultified, right? Like we, we tend to look at young people and think that they're older than what they are. You know, and even in this conversation, you mentioned you were 22, I believe, you know? So, and not to put you on the spot, but like, I'm 40. <laughs> 22 is, 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 is your, <laughs> you're a young person. But again, like people have different ideas with that looks like, but also again, like, we tend to see youth a lot of times older than what they really are. We tend to adultify them, especially through the lens of the system, right? Like we sentence youth as like adults in a lot of different ways. Um, uh, but we also do that like socially, you know? Um, so just wanted, wanted to, 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 to add that in there. Um, I would just yeah. add one more thing. Sorry, I talk a lot. But no, no, go ahead. Just, just, in there, <laughs> how, right? Oppression shows up in this ageism, right? So if we think back to why, um, most like more than likely young women of color are looked at to be more grown than uh, a younger white woman. Mm -hmm. Look at the culture that we've we've adapted to, right? Mm -hmm. More than likely our families are usually maintaining multiple jobs, which means like me as a young person, I picked up an adult role very young in my in my household. Mm -hmm. You feel me? So how much does that show up in this in this ageism is really important as well. Um, and just how different it is, right? The fact that I'm 15, 16 years old having to look for a job versus my white friend who's living their dandy life at home, swimming in the pool. She doesn't have to worry about signing up for youth at work, you know? Like how different that plays out. Um, I think that that also is something to think about when we look at how ageism is showing up. Mm -hmm. Nice. Folks on um, yours, no, go ahead. Well, yeah, I just wanna add a little bit to that because I think I've done a lot of reflecting y'all from like, as I keep getting older, I, I started doing that when I was 24 going on 25. Cause we had this like thing at 25, your brain is fully developed and all that. I used to make a joke about it all the time. I'm like, great. My brain is fully cooked now y'all at 25. <laughs> um, but now I'm 28, but, it, but I do reflect on this one thing that I think is really important. And this is for everyone who's tuning in, right? Because if you're talking about engaging young people in the juvenile justice space and the youth justice, the criminal justice arena, it's completely different than engaging young people in the mental health sector, the child welfare sector, education, because we're talking about the young people that have been failed by every other system. And legitimately, we are now talking to the young person when he has lost all hope, when maybe he has lost all sense of identity. And so you're not going to just put a young person who just went through hell and possibly got let down by a bunch of systems on platforms just for the hell of having that young person's story, right? Like that was the thing I actively like, that, that was it. The trauma porn bullshit had to stop at some point. That's what I used to call it at that point. So I think we need to be very intentional that, yeah, we, we and even at Youth First, we have the 18 to 25 age range as well uh, because of that intentionality, right? Like we want to support young people who are in that young adult space so that they can then go into their communities locally and mentor the young person who is actively now could be at the front line, right? But it needs to be a leadership pipeline. It needs to be a mentorship, coaching, you know, sort of situation where we, the people who are getting older, are, are responsible for making sure that young people behind us are getting all the supports that they need. And if we're not doing that, uh, we're really doing ourselves, our younger selves, a disservice, and we're doing the next generation a disservice. So I just want to be intentional about uplifting that as we talk about ageism and why we don't have 15, 16 year olds, like Eliana said on this panel, like, you try to throw somebody who just went through the system on this panel, do you think it's going to look good? We're just going to have a bunch of other stuff pop up and are we trained to deal with that here? No, we're not. So I know I'm not. <laughs> don't let the books fool you. I only read one. <laughs> um, no, I'm definitely not trained, but no, I, I like, I like, that's really, you know, it's funny because that intentionality I think is, is, is often missed, you know, as, as we do the work and then as we also in projections about what the work looks like moving, you know, and I, I took a powerful training. In fact, he said, Oftentimes, we, we calling people to do the work versus trying to lead or transform the work. And what you're talking about is the understanding that, you know, um, like, like, hey, I'm not a juvenile anymore, right? The juveniles need to take this, right? And I'm doing this work in a way in which puts them best position to continue that work according to how they see it, you know? Because um, like someone said in the chat, it's like, you know, uh, like, <laughs> this, is, this is your society. This is, this is your... You know, where unfortunately the, the adults are leaving a really bad deal behind, you know? Um, so to, to, to finish off, uh, we're also, we have five minutes, but what I want to do, I think to kind of close this off 
you know, um, is actually, uh, and this is not my original idea, I want to thank her now before I'm put on one spot. Uh, but I, I say I do want to end this conversation um, with hearing, you know, um, from you know, Aisha Ale, Ileana, and Alyssa, you know, particularly, you know, um, what's your vision for, like, when we talk about youth leading the way, right, like the, the title that you gave me so much credit for, um, what does that actually look like? What does, like, youth leading the way look like? And I know that was, but just like, what, what does it look like? Um, okay, so, well, well, the way, like, where I work, JLC, the Juvenile Law Center, we, like, we, we she, they, I mean, they hire at a young age. And when we come in there, like, we just telling our, like, experiences and all that. So we get to speak up for ourselves and, like, who can coach me on what my high experience so like they treat us like experts and all that we're at uh like we ex expert at what we've been through because yeah we've been through it so and can you ask the question again I'm sorry no no just I, you're right like you know what does it look like for you to lead the way you know according to you know from from your eyes from your perspective you know when we say hey we want youth to lead the way you know like what does that actually you know look like through through your through your lens and your perspective uh, uh, putting them up, like, basically on front line to, like, like, yeah, like, lead the way, like you said, like, you the, <laughs> y'all show me what y'all, y'all can do, because it's y'all who done went through it. Mm -hmm. So, I think, uh, like, more, more of, uh, programs and stuff that'll help you come out and be able to speak like that, because we don't have people to speak to about stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I think for me, um, youth leading the way I hear a lot of times um, that, you know, we're, we're creating room at the table for young people to have voices and for them to come step up to the table. But I think youth leading the way is, you know, the youth creating the table for themselves, right? The youth being CEOs at these organizations, the youth not only being brought forward, but them creating, like I said, that their own organizations, their own change, um, you know, leading these movements, not only just being brought forth from people that haven't lived these things and have these great ideas, but allowing, you know, the young people to allow these great ideas to shine without, you know, having a CEO over them, telling them and pushing them to do this. Um, you know, I think at my organization that I work for, which is the Dolores Bar Weaver Policy Center, um, you know, we, it's a great example of young people leading the way, you know, I um, have played a vital role in the organization and creating several different programs and not because someone pushed me or gave me space to do so, but because I was, you know, able to do that on my own time. I was able to say, you know what, I think we need to make this change or I think that um, we need this kind of program, you know, and just that safe space being created um, by all the other people, you know, in the organization, you know, and not only feeling like I was less than than everyone else in the organization because I was the one that had lived experiences, but being paid a fair wage and treated like I was an equal as well. Um, you know, I know a lot of times, you know, young people are brought to the table and, you know, their voices are shut out, you know, and I think, you know, that's that a part of leading the way is that we're really treating young people as equals, so whether that's equal um, in, with their voices, equal with, you know, their time, equal with them being paid. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's not about just creating space for young people. It's allowing them to create their spaces themselves. Yes. And Ileana, before, before you chime in on the current question about leading the way, what does it look like? I also want you to add, you know, in your response, you know, how can people support you? How can people get involved in your work? You know, like what's most urgent for you now? And, and for the people, I know we're supposed to end that five, but I'm going to please bear with us four more minutes, five more minutes to ensure that we get out these ass. Um, so yes, yes, Jaya, these voices do need to be heard. So I appreciate you. So go ahead. 
I would just um, definitely second everything that Alyssa said. Um, when I think of Youth Leading the Way, I mean, Youth First put together a very thorough video called Youth Lead the Way, actually, um, where we talk about, right, it's not having a meeting with the young people and then going and having a meeting with the older people to discuss what the young people discussed. Or it's not just driving the car and then, like, teaching them how to drive it and then taking the car back, right? It's it's giving them that, that car and teaching them how to drive and go with it, run with it, right? Creating leadership opportunities in your um, workspace right along with making sure that you're you have support plans in place to make sure that you're helping them heal right so acknowledging that these young people have been through a lot of stuff you need to make sure you're building their leadership while also making sure that they have the space to heal and do what they got to do to do the work um, to their best ability and I think just ways to support um, my organization and other organizations is really just getting involved, right? Identifying what, how do you support? Some people don't like to protest. That's not their thing, right? So that might mean you're writing letters to the governor. You're reaching out to your local representative. You're um, signing on to some petitions and other organizations. You're Googling websites and seeing other ways that you can get involved, right? Either it's, it could be donating money to a community organizing um, organization or a grassroots organization. I feel like everybody has their different ways of how they support and how they show up in the work. Mm -hmm. um, it's just making sure that you're intentionally doing something, right? Because as they say, if you, if you sit back and you do nothing, you're choosing the side of the oppressor, right? Do something, so show some sort of support. Um, even if it's writing, right? Whatever your testimony might be for a bill, um, just finding out what, in what ways you like to support best and then actually taking that next step to do so. I'm going to ask folks to just keep your responses in under a minute and also uh, or in a minute under and then uh, for folks who are timed in, if you want to connect with anyone here, please either, you know, email us directly and we'll connect you directly with, with all of the panelists or, or whoever you want. You don't need to go to a near cap and talk to them, but um, if there's a question, anything comes up, we'll connect you directly. So go ahead. How can folks get involved here? Yeah, I can, I can say for Youth First, um, please go to nokidsinprison.org. Literally all of our resources, including the video that Ilian just mentioned is there. We have reports, uh, numbers, and if you're a numbers person, we have all the numbers on how much it costs to incarcerate young people across different states, the cost of in comparison to education. And we put together a COVID-19 response uh, and, uh, resource site on our actual website. So there are a bunch of templates and other things, as Ileana mentioned, that are gonna be helpful for people. And on, on the social media platforms, just look for Youth First Initiative or No Kids in Prison. And if you just want to support me individually, at Carvenza Hernan on all social media platforms. And really just thank you for all the young people who showed up to this and thank you to everyone else. And thank you, Johnny, for being a dope ass moderator. Nice. And I'm gonna jump in very quickly. Um, um, well, I'll, um, definitely visit www.fairsentencingyouth.org to learn more about our efforts and life without parole for kids in the country. And, and I'm happy you asked that question, Johnny. Like, there is a great sense of urgency in the movement right now. Um, currently, we have, we have a bill moving forward in Ohio State um, that's being, that's Senate Bill 256, which will actually effectively end life without pro for kids there. Uh, unfortunately and sadly, there are contending bills that are also moving through the Capitol that would, would actually maintain that in the state of Ohio. So. Um, I'm asking, we're asking, and I hope that those in the faith community will feel compelled uh, to be able to call members of the Senate uh, Judiciary, Judiciary Committee hearing before Wednesday morning, which is when Senate Bill 256 will be up uh, for the hearing. Um, we ask that you call the Judiciary, the Judiciary Committee uh, hearing uh, uh, committee and let them know what you think about life without parole for kids. Let them know that such a, a consequence should not be imposed on children, that all children are, are worthy and deserving of an opportunity to have a second chance and redemption and, and, and most importantly, an, an, a meaningful opportunity for release, which is what we're fighting for. Uh, so again, it's Senate Bill 256. Um, please do look up um, if you want those names specifically. I don't wanna put anybody out there, uh, but if you want the names specifically, you can find their, their names on, online uh, at the website, at the legislator's web, website. I really hope that you uh, make that call. It'll, it'll make a big difference for, for the kids and for those who have been serving extreme sentences for many decades since childhood. Thank you. Hi, Shelly. Um, okay, so I'm sorry. Can you say what we were supposed to do again? 
Yeah, so yeah, so how can people support you in the work that you're doing? Okay, uh well for starters, like any youth they know that uh is like is going through it like in a foster care system, juvenile justice system. For starters can read our our some of the projects we came up with. Uh, like ed Operation Education, which is focused on uh, youth and leaving placement with schooling, like the schooling they leave placements with, or Broken Bridges, which was the one before last year. Like, yeah, or can just like give them like information to uh, uh, us or anybody else that's on this panel. As just keep them off the street. Like, find more programs for people like me and like that and I'm glad thank you for having me nice so thank you to each and every one of you not only my panelists but also folks who, who chimed in um, I, uh, if you registered for this webinar that means you're here uh, we will follow you directly with the bios of the panelists uh, their social media information uh, and ways to contact them and any any follow-up questions that come up and uh, please stay tuned uh, for more fire, fireside chat conversations this month and some more webinars on a ton of different issues Again, peace, love, respect, and we love each other. Thank you all. And I'll be downloading this entire chat box and sending it as, a, as an attachment. So um, uh, that's a practice where we're trying to do so. Um, yeah, I see the response to that. So again, we'll download this. We'll make sure that folks get it. Again, you can contact me directly. I'll make sure that whoever needs to get a message, folks are connected. Again, I'm not going to hold y'all. Love y'all all. Thank y'all so much. Later. Thank you, guys.